So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Billy Teets and I am the staff astronomer here. And so tonight, um, since we have the holiday season fast approaching, um, we thought we'd split the talk into to two topics tonight. We're going to spend a little bit of time at the beginning talking about if you're interested in getting a telescope, what should you look for when buying a telescope? About this time every year, we get lots of phone calls and emails of people asking, saying, my, my grandson or, or my wife wants to have a telescope, what do I need to get? You know, or is this particular telescope a good telescope to buy for the money? So um, I thought we'd spend a little bit of time at the beginning, I'll just go ahead and put up the outline here, talking about um, the different types of telescopes. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the main categories of telescopes, some of their advantages and disadvantages, a little information about maybe some mounts and things like that. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to try to kind of guide you as to what we would recommend for a telescope. Um, we'll also do some recommendations for additional observing aids, so things to, that you might want to consider buying with the telescope. Um, and then, um, wintertime is often a really good time to get out with the telescope. We've got low humidity, that usually makes for a little bit clearer skies, and there are a lot of nice targets to view in the wintertime. And so I thought we would go over just a, a few of those targets of interest, and I'll give you a little bit of information about what those things are, just so as you're seeing them through uh, a telescope, maybe for the first time, you can get a better appreciation of what you're actually looking at. Because sometimes they just look like these faint little smudges that don't really look like much of anything, but when you understand what you're looking at, you can really um, get a lot more out of it. And then at the end, and I'm going to try to keep this kind of short, we've got a bunch of telescopes and observing aids set up in the very back of the room. We've got uh, Dr. Ken Garrison standing up back there, Dr. Bob Schweikert sitting in the very back there, and myself, and I thought what we would do is go back there afterwards. If you guys have not seen some of these things or, or worked with them at all, you can get an up-close look at them, kind of mess around with them, ask us questions and, and things like that. So you can get a better idea of, you know, if you want to get this telescope, what are you actually getting? And unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to do any viewing tonight, so uh, we'll still have the Seifert telescope doors open. If you want to go up and see the telescope, you're welcome to do that, okay? All righty. So just a little bit of info about the main categories of telescopes first. So this is what people normally think of when they hear the word telescope. You know, or you think of a pirate looking out over the ocean at you know, the next ship that he's going to try to conquer. This type of telescope is a refractor. It was the first type of telescope ever invented. Uh, in fact, we just celebrated a few years ago at the 400th anniversary of the invention of the refracting telescope. Um, but in this diagram over here, this is the very basic idea of how this telescope works. It's got a big lens at the front, uh, which catches the incoming light, focuses it down towards the eyepiece lens. Now, a good telescope is not going to be quite this simple. It's not just going to have one single lens up here and one single lens back here. Um, there are usually going to be a couple of lenses up at the front, in order to correct for something known as chromatic aberration. So this is an image taken through a very low quality telescope. You can notice that it's the moon, hopefully you can tell that's the moon. Um, but along this top edge, you definitely notice this blue hue, which you normally don't see with your eye. And then along this bottom edge, you see this nice orange hue. It may look kind of pretty, but that's really annoying if you're trying to get a really nice image of the moon or maybe a planet or a star or something like that. Um, the reason this is occurring is because the lens is acting a little bit like a prism. In fact, if we go back, if I were to zoom in on this lens right at the very top here and just kind of take a cross section right there or just a little slice off the top there and look at it closely, it would basically have this shape. So a single lens collecting white light will inherently spread out the white light into all of its colors. doesn't really matter what the lens is made out of or how good a quality the lens is, a single lens acts like a prism to some degree. 
Um, if the lens is very fat in the center, you get that effect even more. There are ways to counteract this, though. So if we were to put a second lens up here with a little bit different curvature, right behind this first lens, and also make that lens out of a different type of glass, then it's possible that as this light comes in and is focused, but is also spread into all of its colors, that second lens will catch all of those colors, continue focusing the light, but also refocus all of the colors back to white light. Okay? That type of refractor is known as an apochromatic refractor. Or you may hear of an achromat refractor. An achromat is better than this, but it's not the best. Apochromatic is basically a really, really good achromat refractor. There's a problem, though. In order to see faint objects, you want to have a big lens. You want to be able to catch as much light as you can to make those faint objects bright. So that means you're not only going to have to grind this side of this lens, you also are going to have to grind this side of this lens, as well as the two sides of that second lens. That's going to add up in cost. If you want to get a really high-end refractor that you really cannot tell any color distortion in, you may spend upwards of about $10,000 just for the telescope. And that's not a humongous telescope. I'm talking about one that has a, an opening at the front about like that. All right? No, those, they're really great telescopes. If you've ever had or ever get the opportunity to look through one of those telescopes, say at the moon or at a planet, the views are phenomenal. Okay? So um, astronomers, amateur astronomers especially, that are really into uh, photography or getting these really gorgeous views, they will shell out the cash for that. Okay? But it's worth it if you want to get that really, really nice, beautiful image with that type of telescope. So keep that in mind. So the next major type are the reflecting telescopes. Now when we're talking about the telescope, we're not including the eyepiece. In order to look through any telescope, you're going to have to have an eyepiece. Otherwise, your eye is not going to be able to form an image correctly. Now in a reflecting telescope, and again, we are not, ex we are not including the eyepiece, you have at least one mirror in here which is responsible for the image formation. In this type of telescope, this is known as a Newtonian, named after Isaac Newton, who, did, who uh, first developed it about 50 years after the first refractor. This telescope, so this is where the, the light comes in here. The light comes in, hits this curved primary mirror. That mirror focuses the light towards the front of the telescope. But there's a second flat mirror here, which intercepts that light and shoots it out the side to the eyepiece. All right. You could actually put an eyepiece where that secondary mirror is and get an image, but your head would be blocking out a lot of the light. Okay? So it's better just to shoot the light out the side so that you're not obstructing the view. The nice thing about a reflector is that a mirror will not suffer from chromatic aberration. When you look in the bathroom mirror in the morning, you don't see color rings around your, your face unless you had a, a hard night the night before. <laughs> so this primary mirror, you've only gotta, you only have to grind one side of it. Um, that's easy enough. This flat mirror, a flat mirror is easy to make. So you don't have to put in a lot of money into the manufacturing of this telescope. Okay? Um, now this particular model over here, this is a Newtonian telescope on what's known as a Dobsonian base. And we're going to talk more about those in just a moment. Okay? But the main idea is that you have mirrors here which are forming the image instead of lenses. The third main category of telescopes are the catadioptrics. They are the hybrids. They are not only a reflector. Uh, so and here's a cross section of one of these telescopes. We've got the primary mirror here a secondary mirror here, but the catadioptric means that it also uses lenses. This one has a correcting plate on the front of it. This particular style of telescope is known as a Schmidt-Cassegrain. Okay? The Schmidt part 
comes from the fact that it has this plate here. The Cassegrain is this optical design. The big telescope upstairs, when you go up tonight, you probably will get to look down the tube. It is a Cassegrain. Okay? It has a big mirror in the back. Again, we've taken a slice through this telescope here. It has a big mirror in the back, has a smaller secondary mirror towards the front, but this one, instead of shooting the light out the side, it reflects the light back down the tube and sends it through the hole in the main mirror. Okay? So now the eyepiece is at the back. One advantage of this style of telescope is that it can have a very long focal length. So it, its mirrors would essentially focus light um, uh, basically the same way that the mirrors in this telescope are, are focusing. They would focus it over a very long distance. But with this one's curved secondary, it allows you, and the fact that it's reflecting the light back down the tube yet again, it allows the telescope to be very short and compact for its size. So it can be very wide, it can have a very wide aperture, but it doesn't have to be incredibly long. Okay? So th these are really handy for things like photography and whatnot. But with this correcting plate and this curved mirror here, they can be kind of pricey as well. But if you want to do photography, then they're well worth the money. Okay? But the main thing to look for in a telescope is aperture. You go to a department store, you find one of those old telescopes, and it'll say magnifies 500, 500 times. Now that's really impressive, but 500 times, we hardly ever put the big telescope at that high of a magnification. We could put it well past that, and you wouldn't be able to see anything in the telescope. It would be so blurry. But the thing that you want to look for is aperture. You, want, you don't want to care about how long the telescope is. You want to care about how much light can enter it. The more light that enters it, the brighter your objects are going to be. Okay? The other thing is, the aperture also determines resolution. So let's say you're looking at a double star, which is two stars in orbit around one another. Uh, one of the fun things to do when you first get a telescope is to look at a star map, figure out which stars in the sky you can see are double stars, point your telescope at them, and see if you can actually see the two stars. Some of these doubles are called tight doubles because they're very, very close together. A little telescope, even though the stars would be, would be bright, you would see them as one blob because the telescope does not have very good resolution. It may have perfect optics, but the aperture is not large enough to allow you to see the finer detail. Bigger telescopes would allow you to see the two stars. Okay? So for telescopes, bigger is definitely better. All right? And just to kind of take that point to heart, here is the giant Magellan telescope, which is currently being constructed. It will have seven mirrors that when put together will act like one enormous mirror. Here is, so see that central mirror there? There's that central mirror with some of the engineers behind it, okay? So even that one single mirror would gather an enormous amount of light, would have a great resolution. But when you incorporate all of the other mirrors as well, you increase your brightness of your objects, you increase your resolution even more, okay? Um, and then, the other thing that kind of throws people is they'll see these different types of mounts, you know, the thing the telescope is setting on. The first telescope that I showed you, this little refractor, this is on something called an equatorial mount. The telescope's mount is actually tilted over. And when you go upstairs and see the big telescope, it works on the same principle. Its mount is tilted over as well. But this telescope here, this is on what's known as an out azimuth mount. It's a very simple mount. It basically allows the telescope to move up and down, left and right. Okay. Those are the two main types of mounts. Let me get back here. Oop, wrong one. There we are. Nope, there we are. So the equatorial mount, this is the more complicated mount. Um, it's very, um, very suited for astrophotography. It allows a telescope that is motorized to track the sky very well, which is important if you're trying to do a long exposure picture. Problem is, 
it's difficult to align if you don't know what you're doing, especially if you're getting a telescope for a newbie, they're not going to have um, the, the background or the experience to understand um, how this needs to be aligned. It really takes a lot of experience to get things really well aligned. Okay? Even after you read the book and you understand the concept behind it, it just really takes experience. Okay? Also, if you do happen just to use this telescope to observe through, this type of mount, it, from my personal experience, if I'm trying to move it to look at something else, it's kind of tricky to get it to move the way you want because it doesn't just move up, down, left, and right. It moves at angles. So it's a little trickier. It's not impossible, but it's just, it can be a little time consuming to get uh, used to it. But the Alt Azimuth mount, it's very simple. You don't have to align it. You set it down. It moves up, down, left, and right. Okay. So you, just for naked eye or for a telescopic observation, just looking through the telescope, this is really the kind of mount we try to recommend. So if we incorporate all of these different aspects, this is the type of telescope that we recommend to everybody. So it's named after John Dobson. Uh, he did not invent the telescope. He invented the style of base that it's on. This is typically like a particle board. You don't have to have any fancy material. You just need something that will hold the telescope still while you're looking. Okay? So this is about maybe $20 to $30 worth of particle board making up the base. In fact, this style of telescope, this one has a, a metal tube or a metal optical tube assembly, as we call it. Um, I have one at home that is made out of sonotube. So if you see those, uh, those, con or those cardboard tubes that they use to pour concrete in and make posts, it's basically that. Okay? So you can even make your own telescope at it very, very inexpensively. Um, but the, the nice thing about this style is that it doesn't require an alignment. You can actually take this telescope off of its base if you need to transport it somewhere. It makes it much easier to carry. Um, it doesn't have any, um, or this particular model here, it does not have any uh, motors or electronics. So basically the vast majority of your money is going into the optics. So you can put all of your money into getting a really large mirror. Okay? We have uh, a number of different examples of this style of telescope in the back. Um, this one is a 10-inch telescope, and we have a 12-inch model back there and a 4.5-inch model. So you can see those tonight. This is another Dobsonian. This is known as a truss telescope. So we've eliminated a lot of the weight from the tube here by incorporating trusses. We have a really nice model back there. That is an 18-inch telescope, which I'll go ahead and tell you that tall one there, that is a, it has um, an electronic control system in it so it can actually move around and find things. That was a total of about 10,000. The telescope itself would have been about 6,000, okay? But get a little bit smaller, maybe a 10-inch, that's about four to 500, okay? A 10-inch telescope is an awesome telescope. You will see an incredible, incredible amount of stuff uh, with that size telescope. The other nice thing is these telescopes have, they're known as very fast telescopes, or in other words, they focus the light to a point quickly. That gives them a very wide field of view, which you may think, well, that's going to make everything look pretty small when I look at it through the telescope. That's actually good because it makes these faint, fuzzy objects small, but it concentrates their light to make them much brighter. Okay? Uh, when we're looking at things like the Orion Nebula upstairs in the big telescope, we try to get as low of a magnification as possible, and everybody loves those low magnification views the best. Okay. So magnification is not where it's at. Okay. So these telescopes are really good for those that get what's known as aperture fever, where you, you get a 10-inch telescope, then you want a 12-inch, then you want a 16-inch. Like this guy here, um, this is a 42-inch. I think this is the largest one that, um, that is known. So when the telescope is pointed straight up, the eyepiece is 15 feet up. These are nine foot ceilings in here. So it does require a large ladder. The whole thing weighs right at 800 pounds. Um, this is the guy that, that owns it here. 
So whenever he transports it, he has a big trailer and he has to disassemble it. But believe it or not, um, he was saying that as long as people aren't bothering him, because, you know, it's going to attract attention, it only takes him about 45 minutes to get it all set up and going. But the, the views are incredible through it. So now to go along with the telescope, you're going to need some eyepieces. Now, if you were to order, let's say, one of those Dobsonians, pretty much every company is going to include at least one eyepiece in them. It's typically about a 25 millimeter. Um, one thing you're going to want is at least two eyepieces. And you can get more and more over time. Um, so the eyepieces are ultimately what are going to determine the magnification. If you want to zoom in on an object, like let's say a crater on the moon, you switch out to a different eyepiece. Okay. So eyepieces are listed by their focal length. Like this one here, a very common one is a 26 millimeter, and it'll have the number on the side. If the number gets smaller, the magnification goes up. Okay. So normally what we try to recommend is, this is the one that, it's, usually this one comes with the telescope. We would also recommend maybe a 10 millimeter eyepiece. <coughs> now, if you're going to get additional eyepieces, and there are lots of them out there, you can spend more on a single eyepiece than the entire <coughs> telescope. Uh, for instance, like this one here, this is a couple of hundred bucks. And we have an example in the back there that you can check it out. But these really big eyepieces, they deliver really nice views. So you want an eyepiece that has good eye relief, or in other words, the optics are set up so that you basically don't have to press your eyeball right up against the glass to be able to see in it. You can be at a comfortable distance, you know, maybe about uh, six or seven millimeters from it to where your eyelashes aren't hitting it. It's comfortable and you can see in there very well. Uh, you want a good exit pupil, so if if all of the light is concentrated down to a very small area and all of that area is able to enter your eye, then you're taking advantage of the telescope's light gathering ability. If you have an exit pupil that's really large, let's say 10 millimeters, that's wider than your dilated pupil, a lot of the light coming out of that is missing your pupil. So you're wasting telescope light gathering capability. Okay? And then finally, field of view is um, also kind of important. That's where these guys really come in. These often will have 80 degree, even up to like 120 degree fields of view. Or in other words, when I go to look into one of these eyepieces, I get my eye right up to it, and I physically have to move my head around to see everything in the field of view. I mean, it's like you're looking through a little window and you've got to kind of move to see everything. So the fields of view are, are really, really nice, okay? Um, just a little bit on magnification. Um, so if you want to determine your magnification, that is the focal length of your telescope, uh, which is usually written somewhere on the telescope, divided by the focal length of your eyepiece. Okay, simple as that. Um, you always want to start out with your lowest magnification, let's say a 25 millimeter eyepiece when you're searching for something and then switch to a higher magnification once you've found your object. Otherwise, it makes it very, very difficult to find what you're looking for. Okay? Um, and like we've said before, higher magnification is not always better. Um, if you bump up the magnification, especially like past 300 or 400 power, especially for fainter objects, you're hardly going to see anything in there. Only thing that I personally ever do a high magnification on is maybe the moon, because it's nice and bright, and it's got some very, uh, uh, especially if you're like at a first quarter moon, you can see a lot of contrast. So higher magnification actually works out pretty well then, but there's still a limit to it. If you go really high, then everything becomes blurry, no matter how good your telescope is. Um, I would also recommend a Barlow lens. So you already have your one eyepiece from your telescope. Maybe get your 10 millimeter. Your Barlow, it slips on to the end of your existing eyepieces and it multiplies your magnification. So this particular one is a 2x Barlow. So let's say this was, this eyepiece here gave me a magnification of 50. If I then put this on the end of it and stick the whole thing in the telescope, I now have a magnification of 100. So if I had three eyepieces, 
let's say a 25, a 10, and a 5. If I got one of these bar lows, I would now effectively have six eyepieces, okay? Because I could put the, the bar low on each of those individual eyepieces and get a different magnification. Moon filters, these are very cheap. I'm anywhere from maybe 10 to 15 bucks. Um, there are filter, these are filters that just screw onto the end and they just dim down uh, uh, the light of the moon. So they're really useful when the moon's getting towards full because when you look in there, it's like looking into a little spotlight. It's not going to damage your eyes, but it, it's not as comfortable as if it, the moon is, is dimmed a little bit. We have an example back there of a variable moon filter. It's basically two polarized lenses, and they mount on top of one another, and if you just rotate one, it'll change how much light it lets through. So if you've got a full moon, then you, know, you can really tone down the moon a lot, but if you've got, let's say, a first quarter moon and you want to dim it just a little bit, then you just turn the filter just a tiny bit. Okay? So they're pretty versatile. Just don't ever use those for the sun. That's a totally different filter and, and set up altogether. Um, binocular astronomy is also uh, really, really good. So there are a lot of things like, uh, for instance, the Pleiades star cluster, the Milky Way, things that if you look at them with the telescope, you can only see a tiny bit of it one time. And if you look at them with binoculars, you see the entire thing, and it gives you a much better view. So um, binoculars are also a really, really good observing aid. And you can get some that are really good and not that pricey. So on the side of the binoculars, you'll see two numbers. Um, this is a I think this one is a 10 by 50. The first number tells you magnification. The second one tells you the diameter of the lens. So if I had a 10 by 70, that would be a little bit bigger than these 10 by 50s. So bigger is better, right? Well, with binoculars, that may not be the case. Because if you're standing there scanning the sky and you've got these really big honking binoculars here, they weigh a fair amount and your arms are going to get tired. Okay. So that's something to consider when you, if you do want to get some binoculars. Okay? And you can always start out with a small pair and then you know, kind of work your way up. But again, they're really great for, for just scanning the skies. Um, when, I lived, uh, when I was in undergrad and was living at home, uh, I was in decently dark skies, and sometimes I would just lay on my back, and, and I had a, a decent set of binoculars, and I would just kind of let them rest on my cheekbones and I would just scan the sky and I could even see some nebulae and, and things like that. And even though they were smaller, it was a really nice view being able to see those nebulae with all of the stars surrounding them instead of just looking through a telescope and just seeing the nebula, which was cool, but having this really wide field of view really added to it. Okay. Just a, a couple of other accessories and then we'll, we'll move to some of the targets. Um, I would definitely recommend a red flashlight. You can get just a white flashlight and put some red cellophane on it, but you really need these at night if you're using star maps. Um, if you're looking through it, if your eyes are dark adapted, if they're used to the dark, and you're looking at these faint fuzzy objects, you're using the rods in your eyes. Okay? They're very good in low light levels. They don't see color, but they're good when you're in very, very low light levels. If you turn on a white light, then you all of a sudden zap those rods and you can't see anything for a while. But they don't respond well to red. Okay? So if you use a red flashlight at night, you're activating the cones in your eye, but you're not activating those rods. And so your eyes still stay dark adapted and you can still see these faint objects. Um, if you're just starting out, I would recommend something like this. There are a lot of different field guides and just uh, star map guides. Um, I actually have an example of this one up here. And you all can look at it um, after the talk. But for instance, this one has maps of the sky for every month. And then it goes in and zooms in on areas for each month. Uh, so you can locate faint fuzzy objects. So these are really, really good if you're just learning the sky. It'll help you learn the constellations and things like that. Um, not that expensive either. Uh, moon maps. This one locates or um, notates 260 features of the moon that you can see with the telescope. 
tells you about what they are, like their size and, and things like that. Um, if you're not, or if you're still learning the sky, this thing, it's called a star wheel or technically a planisphere. It's basically two dials. One has a date, one has a time. You match up your current time with your current date and it will display the sky above you. This is the entire sky above you. And so you can learn some of the constellations that way. Um, it will not show you planets though. Okay, you have to find those on your own. But there are also things like uh, Stellarium, which we'll use tonight when I talk about some of the objects. That's a free planetarium program, and it basically incorporates uh, the best of all of these. Okay, and you can learn the sky there. Um, so two more things, and then we'll move to the, the targets. So what could you expect to see? You're typically not going to see color unless you're looking at planets or stars. Those objects are bright enough to activate the, the cones in your eye. The only time that I've seen any color in some of these faint fuzzy objects like galaxies or nebulae was when I was observing the Orion Nebula. That one is one of the brightest nebulae and it does have a distinctive, um, uh, there's a, 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 a green color of light that is emitted by oxygen in the nebula, or in fact in a lot of these nebulae. And because that nebula is so bright, it was putting out enough light that I could see a very faint green color in it. Okay? But typically, these faint fuzzy objects are going to appear very gray. Okay? So it's not going to be like you know, the images you see in the hallway. Most of it's going to be faint and fuzzy and gray. Okay? But still, once you realize what you're looking at, then you, um, you get a better appreciation. And speaking of looking at faint fuzzy objects, um, when you're looking at things like star clusters or nebulae or galaxies, if you look straight at them, you're using the rod or the, the cones in your eye. You're focusing a lot of light on the cones, which can't see well in low light. But if you look off to the side, then the light gets shifted to the rods in your eye, and all of a sudden these objects become a little bit brighter. In fact, there's one nebula, it's a, called a planetary nebula, but its nickname is the blinking nebula because if you look straight at it, you can barely see it at all. But if you look off to the side, it's like a little light just comes on. And if you look back and forth, back and forth, it looks like it blinks on and off. Okay? So this is known as averted vision. And when you're getting into finding these objects, you may see these M objects or these NGC objects. The M objects are Messier objects. They're named after Charles Messier, who put together a catalog of these bright, fuzzy objects that he kept finding in the sky as he was scanning the sky looking for comets. So in his day, that was his big thing, was trying to search the sky systematically looking for these comets. And every now and then, he would find these faint, fuzzy things. He didn't know if they were a comet or not, so he'd make a note of where they were. Come back a couple days later, if they'd moved, and he knew that it was a comet. They didn't move, he knew it could not be a comet. He didn't know what it was, but it wasn't a comet. And that's all he cared about was if it was a comet. So, um, after searching the skies for a while, he had a list of about 110 objects. And they tend to be some of the brightest nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies. And so these are the favorite targets of, of uh, folks, especially when they first get a telescope. Um, NGC objects, there are literally several thousand of these objects. Um, it just stands for New General Catalog, but um, they're just a, a really large listing of star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies, most of which you won't be able to see by eye, no matter how big your telescope is. Okay, you have to take a, a long exposure photograph to see it. But every Messier object also has an NGC number. Okay. All right, so let's just spend just a few minutes and talk about some of the targets you might want to look for this winter. So one of the first things is um, wintertime is a good time to see a portion of our Milky Way. So these are some really nice time-lapse images of the Milky Way and Earth's rotation showing the, the Milky Way moving. Um, but this band of light going through here, this is the disk of our galaxy. So our galaxy is like a big frisbee in shape. We sit inside of it, and so it looks like a band going across our sky. 
Now this portion of the galaxy here, you notice it kind of bulges out. It's a little bit brighter. That is the center of our galaxy. It's where the supermassive black hole lives. You can see that part of our galaxy in the southern sky during the summertime. And you're actually looking towards the center of, of our home galaxy. Um, this is a view from the southern hemisphere. These are two satellite galaxies of our Milky Way. They're called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, and they orbit our galaxy, uh, just kind of like the, the planets orbit the sun. There you can see the band of our galaxy there. Um, but now in the wintertime, we're looking away from the center of our galaxy. And so it won't be quite as bright as what you see like right through here. Now you'll also notice that the, the galaxy is not uniform. There's a bright spot there, there's a lot of dark spots over here, and these dark lanes running right through there. So those are hallmarks of a spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies have a lot of dust and gas in them. That's what forms stars. Um, and so as we, if we're, if there are big pockets of dust between us and some of the background stars, that dust is really effective at blocking out that starlight. And so it wasn't until about a hundred years ago that we understood that these dark areas in our galaxy or in the sky in the band of the Milky Way were not devoid of stars, but they were actually just these big areas of dust that were blocking out the light of the stars. Yeah, so here is, yeah, there's Orion rising there. Our Milky Way runs right down next to Orion. Okay, you'll notice that that part of the galaxy is not quite as bright as um, the summertime part, because again, we're looking away from the center. Okay, we're looking towards the outer edge of our galaxy, and there's less stars um, when we look that way. But if we could fly up out of our galaxy and look back, this is an artist's concept of what we would probably see. So our galaxy has several prominent spiral arms. We set, so there's a center, we set about this far out in one of those arms. Um, this is Messier 109, or M109. It's a nice galaxy that you could see with the telescope. And it's a really good analog of what we think our galaxy would look like if we could fly up out of our Milky Way. Uh, let's see, but again, we're sitting in it. So from the side, it looks like this band going across. And again, this is where all the dust is. If we look at our galaxy in infrared light, which is really good at penetrating that dust, we can see the glow of all the stars. And so this is an infrared view of our galaxy. It's lined up with this image. And so you can see in this area here, which looks like it's lacking stars, there are in fact a lot of stars there. It's just all that dust is blocking it out. Now I'm going to, let's see here, I'm going to switch over to Stellarium. Oh, come on now. I don't know why it wants to do that. Hold on, let me exit out of this. All right. So Stellarium is uh, one of those planetarium programs that I was uh, mentioning earlier. Let me turn off this. So it's set for Nashville, and right now it's simulating the sky uh, for our current date and time. So we have the moon rising there over in the east. But we can fast forward and go to January. All right, so that's about the 5th of January at close to 7 o'clock. I'm going to move it forward a couple of hours here. Okay. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. All right, so this is about 9.30 on January 5th. Orion, so if you aren't familiar with your constellations, this will show you the constellations. It will even show you what they're supposed to be. It'll label them for you. But let's zoom in on Orion just a little bit here. So Orion is easily recognized by the three belt stars here. In fact, those three stars, if you connect them with the line and continue on down, they'll point 
to the brightest star in the night sky, which is Sirius. And that's a really nice start of view in the wintertime. But if you get your telescope and you look at the sword of Orion, or the dagger of Orion, so this is his belt, the dagger is hanging off of his belt, look at that central star there. Let me zoom in there. And it's a nebula. So that is the Orion Nebula, or Messier 42. And let me switch back over right quick here. Oop, not what I wanted. All right, so there's Orion. This is a really, really nice deep image, or in other words, it's a very long exposure image. So here's the two shoulder stars, the belt, the dagger, the, the two legs there. I'm going to zoom in on this very quick, turn it on its side. This arc of gas is known as Barnard's Loop. So if you saw the front display case out there, there's a little section about Edward Emerson Barnard. He's the one who discovered this, uh, this big arc of gas. He was an astronomer here at Vanderbilt in, in Nashville. Here's our Orion Nebula. And here's the star Rigel. So we're going to focus on those two things right quick. This is a nice mosaic from the um, Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this is a, a really large image, actually, um, actually bigger than the full moon. But this part of the nebula is M42, or what everybody refers to as the Orion Nebula. This little area up here is called Demerans Nebula, or M43. Okay, they're really part of the same complex, but when you look at them through a telescope, you really see this area here, and you see a little bit of this. But if you do a very low magnification, you can actually see some of this nice bowl structure of this nebula. If we zoom in on the center of that, this is really, this is about what you would see, uh, maybe a little bit brighter, but um, this is about what you would see in a good um, large telescope on a dark night. The four stars down here are called the trapezium, and especially that star right there, that's what's responsible for lighting up this nebula. Okay? There are about 2,000 stars that have formed out of this, this big cloud, okay? um, and those stars in the center are very, very massive, and they're putting out a lot of light and, um, and, and particles called solar wind, and that's actually blowing away a lot of this gas and creating that bowl shape. Um, this is also uh, where we first found evidence of things called propylids, or protoplanetary disks. So here are the four trapezium stars right there. This is a, an, another Hubble view. But what we've done here, we've zoomed in on little objects that you see silhouetted against the background gas. So the red glowing things are stars that are almost finished forming, and then the black around them is the cocoon of dust and gas that is um, still surrounding those stars. That's what those stars formed out of, and this could be uh, later on formed into planets around these stars. So these are basically baby solar systems being formed right now. Now we mentioned Rigel, that one star. That's a fun target to check out because it's a double star. So what you see in the night sky is this big bright guy right here. It's actually a very massive star. But if you look at it through a telescope under decent magnification, you'll see it's got a little companion. Okay? So it's just one of the fun double stars to try, to try out there. All right. Some of the other fun things are open clusters. So these are very young groups of stars. Uh, some of the youngest are only about a million years old, which seems very old. But for stars, that's very young. The oldest are maybe a couple of billion years old. Uh, but these are groups of stars, maybe a few thousand at most, that's, that formed out of the same cloud at the same time in the same part of the universe. Um, because they're young, they still have their very massive blue stars. So very massive stars live the, the shortest period of time. And so if you see a cluster that has these really massive stars, you know it has to be young. Okay? But these clusters will gradually spread apart over time. In fact, that's where we get the term open. It just means that they're not gravitationally bound. 
So let me switch over here. We're going to zoom out of Orion. So again, right here is Orion. We're going to move over to Taurus, which is right next to Orion. And there are a couple of really good examples of um, open clusters in Taurus. Okay, so there's the bull. So marking the shoulder of the bull and the head of the bull are the clusters, the Pleiades and the Hyades. So this nice V of stars you can see very well. It's a very good binocular object. And then the Pleiades cluster is another really good binocular object. Let me uh, give you a little bit of a view of that. So here's a really nice long exposure of the Pleiades cluster. Now if you look at this with a telescope, you may at lowest magnification only be able to see about this much of the cluster. So it really helps to have binoculars. Um, here's a nice wide field view with Venus below it. That's about how you see it in the, in the night sky there. Now the cloud that you see here was once thought to be the cloud that these stars formed out of. But we now know that those stars are actually just moving through that cloud. It's a lot of dust. Dust preferentially scatters blue light. So if you look at a true color image of something in space and you see this cloud and it looks blue, it means it's got a lot of dust in it. Um, now if we zoom out and let's see here. So I'm going to zoom out one more time. Turn my constellations back on. I'm going to scoot over one more constellation to Perseus. Okay, zoom in just a bit here. Now, in the, in, under decently dark conditions, you can see this line of stars here. Okay, often, a lot of people say this kind of looks like an umbrella shape, but if you follow that line of stars with your telescope and keep on going down. Right in here is another really nice example of um, an open cluster. In fact, it's two open clusters. It's called the double cluster. You can fit both of these in your field of view, and they look like two little piles of glitter. I mean, it's a really beautiful um, um, pair of clusters. Uh, let's see here. Planetary nebulae. These are a little bit harder to find, but every one of them is unique. These are the end result of a small star's life. So our sun will do something like this in about five billion years or so. But the core of the, of the star collapses down because it's run out of fuel. It forms something called a white dwarf. The outer layers of the star are expelled out into space gradually. Okay? These only last for about 10,000 years or so and then you can't really see them anymore. But um, it's actually a bad name because they have nothing to do with planets. Okay, it's just some of the fainter ones, more distant ones, tend to look round and faint, just like the outer planets. Okay. So here is a really nice example of one in Gemini. Now, this is a really nice Hubble image. Uh, when I look at this through a telescope, I see something more like that. I mean, you can, you'll see this star situated right next to it but this nebula you can tell is definitely much larger than the star okay and let's see give me one more example so here's the cat's eye nebula in draco this is a close-up view of hubble from hubble and then this is more or less what you would see in the telescope obviously not quite that large but you'll be able to see the glowing shells of gas. This is the only one where I have seen the core of that star, that white dwarf. That's that little white spot there. Um, on a good clear night, you'll see this fuzziness, and then it looks like a little beacon right in the very center. First time I'd ever seen that um, in, a, in a planetary nebula. Um, now, Just for the sake of time, let me go through just a couple more here. Uh, globular clusters. These are very compact clusters of a few tens of thousands of stars to maybe over a million stars. Right? There's about 150 of them that we know orbit our galaxy. They're very old. In fact, uh, this one right here 
which you can see in Pegasus, and I'll show you where that is in just a moment, that is about 12 billion years old. Okay. Right, let me switch over. So if we zoom out, oh, let's see here. Yeah, you'll have to catch this earlier on um, in the winter time. But if you follow, so here's Pegasus, body of Pegasus, legs come off there. Here's the neck, there's the eye, there's the nose. Come off right in there, and you'll find that little cluster. Okay. All right. All right, so one final thing. Galaxies, we've already spoken about spiral galaxies. There are other types known as elliptical galaxies that are basically spherical or kind of like football shaped. Um, some of them are enormous, others are very small, and I'll show you some examples. And then there are some that are neither elliptical or spiral, so we call those irregulars. If you remember the, the movie of the Milky Way where I mentioned the two Magellanic clouds, those are irregular galaxies. But um, right off of Pegasus is Andromeda. She makes kind of a V of stars. But right up in there, let me, let me zo kind of zoom around here. All right, so we come off right here. There's a really nice galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy. Wow. Okay. That's a pretty good image. Let me show you one more. Uh, this is a really nice long exposure image. So this is the main Andromeda Galaxy. So the main one is denoted as M31. But you'll notice there's two fuzzy spots here. Andromeda is a nice spiral galaxy. We know it's spiral because we can see the dust in it, and it kind of looks like it's spiraling. But these guys here, they look like little fuzzballs. These are two examples of elliptical galaxies, M32 and then M110. Okay. In your telescope, you'll be able to see all three of these. Now, you won't be able to see the outskirts of this galaxy. What you're going to see is basically the fuzziness right in the center here. Okay, but you should be able to see those two galaxies there. In fact, this is the farthest object that you could see with just your eye on a good clear night, about two and a half million light years from us. And then finally, go up to the Big Dipper. I'm going to zoom out here. Uh, let's see here. Where is our Big Dipper? Okay. I'm going to look in the northern sky here. I'm going to go forward just a little bit in time, get the Big Dipper up. All right, so there's our Big Dipper. I'm going to zoom in on it just a little bit. So the Big Dipper is pretty easy to find. Okay, you got your bowl there. Go on up again. There are two more stars here. And then just hang a, a left and find that star. That one's actually visible to the unaided eye. If you get your telescope pointed at that star, and you start searching around, you're going to find two other galaxies. And you can get both of these in the field of view at the same time if you've got low magnification. So this is M81 and M82. This one has a very elongated shape. It's often called the Cigar Galaxy. This is called Bode's Galaxy. But with the two of them in the same field of view, you can really see the differences in their shapes. Okay. A really nice pair. And the other cool thing is, so here's a, a nice uh, telescopic view. They look like they're really far away from one another, but in fact they're interacting. This is a radio view. So this is showing we're very, very cold gas. We're talking almost absolute zero gas is, is located. So this is Bode's galaxy, M81. Here's M82 over here. 
you can see how the streams of gas are connecting these galaxies. So even though they look far apart, by looking at other types of light, we can tell uh, a little bit more about what's going on. Okay. All right, so that is all that I have. So um, we can take questions or we could all adjourn. And if you want to check out the telescopes, we can take questions back there. It's totally up to you. I'd like to see some. Yeah, so, yeah, we can just kind of talk and mingle back there if you like. And so if you have any uh, questions about anything, you can ask Dr. Bob, uh, Dr. Garrison. Um, I think Alex has left, but... Okay.